Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Hope you're having a good time at Data and Innovation Summit here. Day two, uh, exciting here. Uh, what I want to talk about is IoT. It has been around for some time now. I think uh, there are many numbers, many predictions, how many connected devices using IoT. But I think the number is not important. The, the relative growth at which it is growing, that is important. Uh, I read last that there were about three connected devices per individual in this globe today and expected to grow to 10 in the next five to seven years. And that is really exaggerating. Uh, coming back to, I think, if some of us were here in the previous presentation, one and a half million sensors in a company, Equinor, we sell almost 4.2 million SKUs every single year. And we are expecting to have them 70 to 80% connected, not just with one sensor, many sensors in them, but connected is the word. Uh, in coming one to two years from now. We already have a lot of them connected. But what is happening is that this IoT creates a lot of data, so many connected devices, giving us a lot of functionalities, you know, control, features, capabilities, and this heap is growing. But what we are seeing more and more is that as this heap is growing, there are some cracks which are starting to appear. We have issues with connectivity. We have issues with bandwidth. How much data can we get back to the cloud? We have issues like data quality. We have noise in the data. And, and how do we fill that? And one way that we have figured out at Husqvarna is that if we start using AI technology and apply that on the edge, and that is what in our terminology we call edge AI, that is how probably we could start to fill these cracks and then take that to the next level. So, uh, sorry, I come back to, to the introduction. Uh, my name is Girish Agarwal. I'm leading Husqvarna Group's uh, AI lab, as we call it. What do we mean by that is we are challenging our own business before someone else comes and disrupts us. So we use technology to create new data-driven services. That's what we are doing. Uh, what I want to cover today is, uh, of course, a small, very quick digital journey for Husqvarna that we have taken so far some of the edge projects and then what are the learnings from there and taking it forward that how we are putting AI on our products to fill the cracks that we are seeing. I don't know if you're aware, 330 years is what we have been around, one of the oldest companies listed across any stock exchanges globally. We are celebrating 60th year of our chainsaw and actually 24th year of our auto mover that you see right in the center, 1995, when the first robotic mover was launched to cut our grass and maintain green spaces. We have, what it means is that we have transformed ourselves, not once, not twice, but many times in the past, but what it also means is that we have a lot of legacy. But we are getting more and more into digital products, uh, into connectivity, and so on. Uh, we started our digital journey, I would say 2013, 2014, when the word digital was out there, probably a lot known to everyone now. Uh, and we started on a program that we call Next. The output of that program was that we have a digital strategy, we have a roadmap, how to get there. And there were two more outcomes from that. One was what we called connectivity. That was a phase one of digital strategy. Get, get our products, get our devices connected. And that's where the IoT part and the data part comes up, which I'll come back to. But the other was also speed boats, meaning that when we are getting there to our strategy, how do we make sure that we are spinning out some of the functions, digital features, and functionalities as we go along the roadway? So that was uh, really important. And when we were doing that, we realized that we need a platform so that which can give us scale and we can do the same things over and over again. So we actually invested quite a lot, looked around, we couldn't find much out there at that time, 2013, 2014, we built a platform for us. And, and what we call it the digital service platform, microservice oriented, we have more than 45 odd microservices now, all public cloud, restful APIs, no ESBs, no point-to-point -point in interfaces and so on. And what the idea is that if our business comes back and says that we need to, we have identified a gap and we need to go to market with that gap, pick the microservices, one, two, five, 20, 25, whatever, build a wrapper around it and go to the market. So we have been able to launch more than 12, 15 digital offerings in the last three, four years, thanks to the platform. And I think that that's the way we want to take it forward as well. And 
So we had the right constituents, 2017-ish, 2018-ish starting. I think we had the right constituents. We had a lot of uh, data, we had cloud, we had open APIs, we had all the connected products, and the cloud was actually open with APIs. So what we said was that now comes the next step of taking it further by something called AI Lab. And I think AI is just, maybe someone will shoot me down for this, is a buzzword for today. Uh, maybe five years from now we'll talk about some other things. But I think what is more important is the lab way of working, meaning how 14,000 people company starts to learn how to fail and how to move forward, learns how to research and not do standard manufacturing having primary development for 18 months and so on. How do we do that? And we tried doing that with the divisions, with our categories directly, didn't really fly. So we said, okay, let's take this as a strategic function under the group technology office directly, and that's where we sit right now. And what we do is, in the center, if you see, we have the digital service platform that I spoke about, but then at the same time, we work in ecosystem mode. We really believe that we will not uh, do things just by on our own. For example, we used to own the design of our product, man we manufacture them, we supply chain them, we sell them, and we service them. But that's not how the future of the industry we believe is going to look like. We will be part of an ecosystem. Let's say if our products do not talk to smart home, will that still be relevant? In some markets, we are already realizing that even if we make the best robotic mover out there, actually integrating it with smart home is where the customer value lies. And we have been making our product smart, but that's not important anymore, probably. So that's the thing, that we have to look out for partnerships uh, with academia, because it's a research area still. There are new things happening, new algorithms all the time. We have to have partnerships with startups, for example. We are working with a lot of startups, and that's where it comes back to edge and so on. Uh, and we are also working with user communities. We have been a B2B company for a long time. We don't understand our users. How do I use now Edge AI to understand our customer interactions, customer behavior, and then put it back into our products? So that's what uh, we are trying to do through the AI Lab, a totally different new way of working. Uh, what we do in AI Lab is, of course, many things. Uh, we do some crazy things. We look at satellite images to understand our green spaces within cities and how to manage them. Uh, we are, have been in robotics for 24 years. We are looking into autonomous systems more and more. We are looking into text mining uh, on our customer uh, calls that we get, for example, identifying a product launch, how does that impact uh, our customer satisfaction. We are looking into predictive systems. We are launching chatbots. We are using uh, AR and VR for our internal operations, product trainings, our dealers and distribution networks, and so on and so on. But the topic for today was edge. So if we come back to, to this, then, uh, as a quick take from our side, Futurum, they did a study in 2018 where almost 93% of the companies said that edge is important for them and, and they are going to either uh, implement something or with respect to edge or they are already doing that. And out of those 93, uh, 93 is exact, uh, for me it was an exaggerating number, but it was really true because then we saw that how the digital mastery of the industry is moving. And actually, Edge was contributing towards that movement where the dig digital laggards were decreasing and the you know, followers and the evaluators were really increasing. But the most interesting part is that out of those 73 who said that we also believe that Edge is quite important for us, only 16% really tried to link Edge into their strategy. They were still not aiming high as I think that Edge AI can deliver. And, and that's where we are coming from, that how do we do that? We have been running a few Edge projects. Just to mention a few of them that you see there, you will see some startups in the bottom. We have worked with Econo, Imagimov, Stream Analyze. We worked with our batteries to identify some uh, remaining useful life in seconds on real time based on how the product is being used by the user. Uh, we did some things on our chainsaws, we did something on our brush cutters, and, and we are rolling out these models out there. 
with a quite impressive accuracy, I would say, and the footprint is quite less. Uh, it's as low as 10 to 200 KB, which is, again, I, I, at least in, I'm, I'm from a technology background, so for me, it's, it's really amazing that what kinds of uh, things that Edge can do. It generates a lot of data, but then, uh, of course, we had a lot of learnings as well. Uh, you know, the first one I would say is that make sure that you are taking the first step. Don't aim very big, but prepare for the future. Running a POC is one thing. Industrializing it is a totally different ball game. So if we don't start to think about industrializing right from before, I think we will fall very soon. Uh, prepare for the battle. It's not about technology. It's all about leadership. It's all about culture, change in the company, way of working. All of these things are really going to hurt us if we want to industrialize these things. Uh, don't be scared to, uh, to test. And uh, I know talent is scarce. We all have been talking about this. But I think there are workarounds. There are, we don't have to be uh, reinvent the wheel all the time. We can use models which already exist out there. We don't have to build a model which is 99% accurate. Maybe 89 is good enough for us. So we have to just identify not reinventing the wheel. And we really believe at Husqvarna that we are just scratching the surface here. Uh, there is a lot of ethical things, uh, and both from inside the product to outside the market. Is uh, society ready for this or not? And so on and so on. So there are a lot of things which will come as we go along the journey, and that's why be prepared for the journey. But another important thing is the customer imperative. Let's keep the customer in the center and not the technology, which we normally at every digital disruption uh, try to do. And that's why the value first. So. Coming to value first, how do we ensure that we are not putting technology in the center? We are not putting ourselves or painting ourselves in a corner, but identifying what value are we going to deliver is that we see that uh, edge computing, for example, and especially edge AI is a spiral curve going upwards. We started off with a lot of sensors, IoT. We started collecting a lot of data. But now let's shift towards the value part. And how do we do that? Again, coming back to my cracks that I spoke about, that in order to fill the cracks, I think if we try to focus not on just the productivity things, but rather customer value capability things, probably we will be much better. And that's exactly what we try to do. Uh, for example, we, when we started, we were also on the top side, just the tip of the iceberg, as we call it, looking into the direct immediate benefits, like. Uh, predictive maintenance, like uh, you know, operational efficiency, because that is what edge connectivity can give us. Uh, like uh, you see their product insights, uh, real time latency reductions, and those were the quick wins, yes, and we all should go for that. But now I think more and more industries also getting towards some business impacts, that how can we work on cost reduction? How does it impact my after sales? How does it reduce my uh, customer visits? How does it uh, increase my first time right? How does it increase my revenues? Because now all of a sudden I have connectivity, I understand the product, I can monitor it, control it. I can actually charge for pay per use. New business models, new pricing models are coming up. So new revenue streams are coming up. But still, we really believe that there is one more thing that is still missing and probably that is the capabilities. And how do I use the same sensor network which is out there uh, to give me soft sensor values? We don't have to put in another hardware sensor just because I want to measure one more thing. Can we machine learn, identify patterns for that one more thing that we are after? How do I reduce my dependence on connectivity? We have bandwidth issues. Uh, how much data, because I spoke about 4.2 million units sold every single year, and that's just one company, Husqvarna. I'm sure we have a lot of competitors out there. Can we get all this data? Yes, I know 5G is coming, data will become a commodity, but is that really sustainable to really get all this data together with the noise, together with all the data variable points back to the cloud and run analytics there and then deploy them back? Why can we not be a bit more smart here? So I think things like, Data have launched, it's coming, it's so much of data, how do we get intelligence at the edge? We have, we can get, you know, rather, I would say, detailed uh, view of the data capture using edge AI on the devices. We don't have to capture everything, we can reduce data noise, we can reduce data, uh, increase data quality, 
we can reduce data volumes a lot. For example, we don't have to create histograms anymore. We are deploying anomaly detection, uh, variance, and, and also outlier detections on the edge using edge AI models to just send the data which is relevant which is outlier, which makes sense, and then using the average means for all the other data points. So that means if we send histograms, we cannot run machine learning on it. But then at the same time, if we can be smart, we can just send the outliers and still do machine learning on it. So there are a lot of things. You know, sustainability is another aspect which is really important. I, I believe that the amount of energy consumption that goes into our data centers on the cloud today is just exaggerating. It's just increasing so much, and, and edge can really play a very important role. Hyper-personalization, I think that's another very interesting thing which is lying deep within. Uh, think about having a batch size of one in manufacturing uh, and not mass manufacturing, because I know my customer, how he's using my hedge trimmer to cut that trim, that hedge on his house, the way he uses it, is very unique to him, is very unique to his garden. I don't need to make general products for everyone. If I understand that customer, that consumer, if every robotic mover understands the garden in which it is running, we can actually create products just for one specific place. And that is a possibility that we see hyper-personalization using edge AI that we can do. And of course, the last one, uh, just for the uh, lack of a better term, we call it Teslafication. Uh, we don't have to really create new products right from the manufacturing. The same product can do different things, probably, by pushing different models on it through connectivity, through IoT that we have. And, and we are really counting quite big on it. It, of course, impacts our direct sales numbers, for example. But then, in the overall uh, run, I think the value still increases. So what we did was that value was the main part here to go, again, going back to the cracks. To fill the cracks, we need to identify the value and deliver that. And one of the ways, there are many other ways of doing this, but one of the ways that we thought we should proceed is, let's create a edge capability map. And let's try to map these functionalities or business impacts or capabilities, whatever we are talking about, into this capability map of edge. And yes, I think, as I said before, a lot of us are still at the productivity level. Some companies like us are going into the efficacy side. We, we can really create outcomes for our users. But then probably there's something more that we can go towards using the capabilities that I have been talking about, like consciousness. What you see on the right side is just one of the value models that we can pick. It was from Bain, if I'm not wrong. It used the value components which were coming from HBR. Uh, what you see on the right side, it might be a bit misleading. It doesn't mean that you have to go up the ladder to actually get more value. It's not about that. It's about identifying what value you want to deliver with your offerings from Edge. And if we are able to do this, uh, at least our experience says that our customer stickiness actually increases. Because customer knows exactly what the brand is for, what the offering is about. If we try to increase the number of uh, offerings, uh, if you see from the right side, how much value components are we trying to target? Uh, Again, one might argue, I don't think we should target more than one of the best companies in the world, for example, I will not name them, they target say eight to 10. But the more the number, as per the research, the more the number that we can target from the value component side, the better customer stickiness, customer advantage, customer satisfaction, and so on and so on that it happens. But this is again, just one of the ways, there can be very many other ways to map and identify the values, but uh, the whole message is that let's not chase the obvious. Let's try to push ourselves. Let's not just be at the productivity layer, but take us to the self-transcendence layer, where we can really try to achieve something for the customer, not just by uh, taking the low-hanging fruits, which we always try to get into. And we cannot do this alone. Uh, that's at least our view, uh, because we cannot be the best machine learning company in the world. We cannot produce the best models, ML models, to identify objects and to identify pattern recognitions of the world. Uh, the best edge model cannot be created by us either. That's at least what we believe. And that's why we are really open for partners 
to make this a success together. Thank you.